Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wholehearted Loving. I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Georgiana. Today, we are together in the same space, <laughs> which is really nice. She is visiting me on my little island in my this weekend. Um, and today, we are going to talk to you guys. We have a quote, actually. We're going to read through a quote by John Wellwood, who writes a lot about love and relationships and to do some parts work talking about it together. Um, but before we do that, we are going to do a body-based self-connection practice to connect with ourselves before we connect with each other and this podcast. Okay. So if you have someone in the room you could practice with, you could do this. Um, otherwise, you can practice with an object and practice this another time when you are in the room with someone. So let's, I'm like squishing my toes into the rug. So let's feel our toes and see what they're touching. And I'm wiggling my butt and feel it fall on the couch. And an invitation to connect with your breath. Just notice what's happening with your breath. And then to take in your space, I'm going to do that through looking at something. I see the yellow leaves up the window. See if you can just look at this thing and be there for one whole breath. Learn to be with things and be with people. And then when you're ready, you can make connection with the person who's in your space with you. <laughs> hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, Gigi. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. nice. Yeah. Well, it's a nice shift. Something that I notice um, when connecting with another person in this way, I learned this after years of doing it just with my own body interfacing with another person, is if I have a small point of physical contact, so like a hand on their knee, I'm much better able to stay present in my body. So that's just a little... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really nice. Um, before we did the connection practice, I'm just saying hi to you. I think I had my hand on your leg. I was holding Stephanie's hand and rubbing her hand. And I think same thing. It just feels more grounding for me to have that connection point and feel her hand in my hand. So if you have that kind of connection and closeness and intimacy with someone or you want to build that with someone, then you might explore and see if that helps you stay more present and connected. Mm -hmm. I think we're both very touchy people, so we know we want that. Yeah. But I didn't know that I was a touchy person before. I would not have guessed that that would have helped me. Um, so, yeah, little tips. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed, so the way we sat and we connected first with ourselves and then the environment and then with each other, like, we've been seeing each other the last couple of days, but, like, that moment of seeing felt very different mm -hmm. than the... Hi, how's it going? And hugs and let's eat together. Um, it was like, oh, I'm here. I'm here and I'm with you. Yeah. There's silence. When you're interacting with people out in the world, your mind's still going, right? There's no silence in there. Uh, so there's no room for spirit or whatever you want to call it. But when we're just here with each other and there's nothing else going on, it's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a good reminder. And then we used to do that actually all the time just in our practice groups mm -hmm. right and so it's nice to bring it into everyday life that took a few seconds mm -hmm. and the connection was like instant yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay john wellwood do you want to say yes. a little bit about yeah so i like to do a lot of reading and geek out and nerd out on books and john wellwood Sort of, I discovered him. He wrote a lot about love and relationships and conscious relationship. And the style of his writing really spoke to me. And this was during a time where I was really doing a lot of inner work, inner healing. And this one excerpt from his book, Love and what's it called? In Love and Awakening, really hit me. And um, I wanted to share it with you. 
And I think it really ties well to the last episode we did on repression oh, and repression. suppression. Yeah. And it really hit home for me what that means and how that looks like in our everyday life. So we're excited for you to get to listen to this excerpt and see what stirs up in you and what it helps you connect with and reflect on. And we'll share a little bit, I think, about how it touches on us on our you know journey. Yeah. Okay. Are you looking at the camera or this? What are you looking at? I don't know what I'm looking at. Just um, in this direction. Oh, it looks like you're looking at the... You can see your eyes better than mine every time, no matter what. Really? I don't know why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to read this to you back and forth. Story time. Story time. Shall I begin? Are you kidding? Yeah. yeah. In Love and Awakening, John Wellwood uses the analogy of a castle to illustrate the world within us. Imagine being a magnificent castle with long hallways and thousands of rooms. Every room in the castle is perfect and possesses a special gift. Each room represents a different aspect of yourself and is an integral part of the entire perfect castle. As a child, you explored every inch of your castle without shame or judgment. Fearlessly, you searched every room for its jewels and its mystery. Lovingly, you embraced every room, whether it was a closet, a bedroom, bathroom, or a cellar. Each and every room was unique. Your castle was full of light, love, and wonder. Then one day, someone came to your castle and told you that one of the rooms was imperfect, that surely it didn't belong in your castle. They suggested that if you wanted to have a perfect castle, you should close and lock the door to this room. Since you wanted love and acceptance, you quickly closed off that room. As time went by, more and more people came to your castle. They all gave you their opinions of the rooms, which ones they liked and which ones they didn't, and slowly you shut one door after another. Your marvelous rooms were being closed off, taken out of the light, and put into the dark. A cycle had begun. From that time on, you closed more and more doors for all kinds of reasons. You closed doors because you were afraid, or you thought the rooms were too bold. You closed doors to rooms that were too conservative. You closed doors because other castles you saw did not have a room like yours. You closed doors because your religious leaders told you to stay away from certain rooms. You closed any door that did not fit into society's standards of your own ideal. The days were gone when your castle seemed endless and your future seemed exciting and bright. You no longer cared for every room with the same love and admiration. Rooms you were once proud of, you now will to disappear. You tried to figure out ways to get rid of these rooms, but they were part of the structure of your castle. Now that you'd shut the door to whatever room you didn't like, time went by until one day you just forgot that room altogether. At first you didn't realize what you were doing. It just became a habit. With everyone giving you different messages about what a magnificent castle should look like, it became much easier to listen to them than to trust your inner voice, the one that loved your entire castle. Shutting off those rooms actually started to make you feel safe. Soon you found yourself living in just a few small rooms. You had learned how to shut off life and became comfortable doing it. Many of us also locked away so many rooms that we forgot we were ever a castle. We began to believe we were just a small two-bedroom house in need of repairs. Now, imagine your castle as a place where you house all of who you are, the good and the bad, and that every aspect that exists on the planet exists within you. One of your rooms is love, one is courage, one is elegance, and another is grace. There there are endless numbers of rooms, creativity, femininity, honesty, integrity, health, assertiveness, sexiness, power, timidity, hatred, greed, frigidity, laziness, arrogance, sickness, and evil are all rooms in your castle. Each room is an essential part of the structure and each room has an opposite somewhere in your castle. 
Unfortunately, we are never satisfied being less than what we are capable of being. Our discontent with ourselves motivates us in our search for all the lost rooms of our castle. We can only find the key to our uniqueness by opening all the rooms in our castle. A castle is a metaphor to help you grasp the enormity of who you are. We each possess this sacred place inside ourselves. It's easily accessed if we're ready and willing to see the totality of who we are. Most of us are scared of what we'll find behind the doors to these rooms. So instead of setting out on an adventure to find our hidden selves, full of excitement and wonder, we keep pretending rooms don't exist. The cycle continues. But if you truly desire to change the direction of your life, you must go into your castle and slowly open each and every door. You must explore your internal universe and take back all that you've disowned. Only in the presence of your entire self can you appreciate your magnificence and enjoy the totality and uniqueness of your life. Hmm. Damn. I think I cried the first time I read that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a reasonable response to that passage. Mm -hmm. Closed a few rooms, have you? I closed so many rooms, slammed the door shut, nailed it shut, chucked away the key rooms that I had forgotten about, rooms that I had deemed like will never be opened. Yeah, rooms that maybe I wanted to keep open, but like put like drapes up around, like let's not show anybody. <laughs> um, or embarrassed that there were rooms in my castle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is very familiar, yeah. This makes me think of elementary school, which I think is when I'm conscious of rooms being closed. Mm -hmm. And then many years later, someone from, I, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, someone from elementary school posted on my Facebook saying something about how rad I'd always been. Like, really liked those rooms, <laughs> but I shut them down and boarded them up. What? And isn't it interesting that we become so conditioned to care whether someone likes our room? Right. So even decades later, if someone says, oh, I liked you, you're like, oh, those rooms were loud. You liked those rooms mm, yeah. instead of, yeah, those rooms are allowed. Yeah. They've always been allowed. Right. I don't really care if you like my rooms or not. Great that you like my rooms. So. Totally. Yeah. When we're kids, the first question we ask new friends who come over is, do you want to see my room? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do we do that as adults? I do that. I'm like, come look at the house. Well, interesting how you feel comfortable saying, come look at my physical house, but not necessarily like oh, yes. our whole emotional house and our, you know, all the parts of ourselves. Yeah. Please be distracted by my physical house. <laughs> Judge me based on the physical house I deem presentable to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like everything I stuffed into the closet before you came. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, repression and suppression. I mean, this is a pretty clear uh, metaphor. Yeah. And I remember just reflecting on like moments, experiences, or like themes, or just ways, ways I got messages, either really explicit messages growing up, or just watching what was frowned upon at home and out in the world to know, okay, you better shut that door. I'll open that one. So for me, definitely there was no like the silliness room boarded shut. Mm. There was a beautiful, very serious room. That's the one that people could come see. There was a very studious child room. Mm. <laughs> there was like a lazy room. Like that was like off limits. Oh yes. <laughs> I can see that for you. Yeah. Um what else was there? The inquisitive room. Mm. Like I, I've always been an inquisitive person and started as an inquisitive child, wanted to understand why. And I think that just came up against Chinese traditional cultural upbringing of like questioning your parents. Mm. It was seen as disrespectful. So I think I stopped, stopped questioning. Probably was very specific. Maybe I didn't slam that door shut, 
but I was very filtered. Mm. I remember, yeah, I remember being in class, whether it was elementary school, high school, university, and I would have questions and I wouldn't ask them because I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble. Or I'm going to ask a question that's going to make the other person uncomfortable. Right. And I better not ask. So there might be safe questions and unsafe questions. Yeah. That's making me think of like the formal sitting room, which you only enter occasionally. And it has the vacuum cleaner marks on it. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. Jeez. Know it all was, I think, probably the first one that really resonates with me of I'm not supposed to, or people don't like it when mm. I know things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When I know too much, when I say too much. Yeah. Yeah, I had some of that too. Of yeah. like, I always had something to say. Like, my true nature is I probably always have something to say. And uh, definitely in many settings, shut that off and turned it. The, the, the room that was open was the say the right thing room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say what you think people want to hear. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so there's going to be rooms that we shut off because other people said they didn't like them. And there's going to be rooms that we shut off because it's painful. It becomes painful for us to enter. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about softness and sweetness which right. felt unsafe for me for a very long time or which i defended mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. so little i'm going to call that a little frilly pink princess room it's just like no thank you take me to the gothic manor yeah i think we had a lot of opposite rooms that were yeah. shut in my castle that you love to live in yeah <laughs> 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 Yeah, I did not. The dungeon was like, oh, let's see. Yeah. No, no dungeon. <laughs> Just be cheery, positive, right. kind to everyone, see the good in everyone. Those rooms were all like open with like, disco party bowl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the wine cellar is adjacent to the dungeon. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot down there. Yeah. Um, I know that I definitely shut down the room of like creativity. Mm -hmm. Um, I think growing up, I noticed my mom was very creative and there's just so much tension I felt between us and I felt really misunderstood. And I remember the, at some point declaring, I'm not going to be like my mom. Mm -hmm. And so just like cut off from that side. There was also, like, this was in influenced by a lot of things. It was also, I saw my parents fighting a lot. And I didn't really see my parents, like, valuing each other's differences and strengths. So my dad was very pragmatic and practical. And that was easier for me. I knew how to live in that world. And I knew how to excel in it. So I was like, okay, fine, like, live in this room. Pragmatic, practical, efficient, effective. Then... I can get some love and approval. And that's more like dad. Mm -hmm. And dad is always angry at mom. So in my mind, I was like, do not be like mom, because if I can be more like dad, I will be more liked and loved. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another reason why I think I slammed that door shut out of creativity. And then the other one was this room i don't know like this way of living i thought that i had to live was to be perfect at everything and i don't think it was like naturally i don't know what naturally skilled at being creative means but i had imaginings of how you had to do things perfectly right. and i could just see that my mom was just more innately gifted or more well practiced or just had lived more openly in that room in her castle mm -hmm. and like I didn't feel that. I was like, my art sort of sucks. It's clunky. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, well, if I can't be good at it, then I better shut that door. Yeah. yeah. So that was definitely one. Is that the door you want to open? Well, what's neat is I think when it must have been what? When we started doing, when I started doing this work, it was like more deeply. It was 2017. 
really exploring duality and different parts of myself and parts that I had shut off, parts that I had um, shut off because I thought they sucked, someone else thought they sucked. I was afraid because I'd be embarrassed if people saw those parts of me. Society tells you they suck, I don't know. And I was like, let me explore what all of those are. And I sort of did a, I don't know if it was a mental tally or maybe I wrote them out. Like I, I was very intentional about let's do the assessment. <laughs> pragmatic. Very pragmatic. Yeah. And there's a line in that excerpt we just read that was powerful to me about opposites. Like every room has an opposite. Mm -hmm. So I would look at what are things that I do show the world. And sometimes I would show them because that's my innate way of being. And sometimes I showed them because I thought that's how you earn love and approval. And I was like, okay, well, I, I have comfort showing this. What's the opposite of that? And like, am I willing to give myself permission to explore some of that, embody some of that, celebrate that part of myself? And I sort of went on a mission on each one of those things. Mm -hmm. And I remember every week after conscious relationship training, like the day after we had a session, I was already clear in the shower. I'd think about what is the thing I have repressed or suppressed in me? that I'm going to focus on allowing myself to reclaim this week. And it was never like reclaiming in like a full, like a hundred percent way. It was like, what can I do this week? Like, so say it was creativity. You're like, what can I do this week that embodies some form of creativity? Mm -hmm. And it could be something that takes five minutes or an hour or whatever, but I would know I'm going to do this thing and it's going to be in service of reclaiming that part of myself. It's going to symbolize bringing that part back to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember another week, it was, I had really repressed my Chinese identity. And so that week I was like, how can I get more connected with that part of myself? So I used every week as which room in the castle has been like hammered shut. Mm -hmm. And in what way, in a small way, because you know, I had a life like work and children and all that stuff. It's not like I'm sitting in an ashram like <laughs> just pondering and meditating and you know um I, I needed small concrete things i could do that felt doable that didn't feel too scary but also i think an important part of my journey was seeing that each little thing i did was symbolic of something much bigger mm -hmm. yeah and it's focus and energy direct in somewhere right it's just bringing your consciousness to this area mm -hmm. that's great so what you mentioned your dad's pragmatism and that being a room in your castle that makes me think about how some of our rooms have been decorated by other people and we can go in and rearrange them you know we can pull out parts that feel good and leave parts that don't yeah i like that yeah yeah i'm thinking of like nuance you know like because i still really love that room in my castle being pragmatic and then now I think there's more discernment of like, in what settings do I want to like lead with that pragmatic side of me? In what settings do I want to let the feeling side lead a little bit more? How can I bring both in? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I also think of like running into one of the rooms and just like throwing down the shit, like being like just scrapping the whole room, being like, this is a room that is totally decorated by somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's burn it to the ground and start fresh with this room <laughs> yeah that's a wonderful check as well um i know sensuality and sexuality was a room that was like bored mm -hmm. and shut like in so many ways yeah like just growing up as a child like those were like not topics you spoke about and death was not a topic we spoke about yeah. relationship with death I think sex is a big one that um, can be very performative, right? That's one where we definitely take cues from outside mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. um, so that was decorated by people we don't even know. It wasn't our parents decorated that room. It was wherever you got your source of information about Cosmos. sex, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that's a great example. You know, if Cosmo had anything to do with decorating my sexuality room, that has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Sex is going to be weird if it's the Cosmo way yeah. for me. And what's weird or weird or interesting is when I say sensuality and sexuality was a 
boarded off room. It wasn't that sensuality and sexuality didn't have a presence in my life. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, but it wasn't authentic to me. Yeah. It wasn't fully expressed, me fully expressed. It was... I think people would like X, Y, Z. So right. that's the way I should. And I can't feel my own body. So yeah. what do I even know about what I would like? Or yeah. what touch feels good? Or what yeah. closeness feels good? Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. Mm -hmm. And like talking openly about sexuality and sensuality. Like I never had a problem in my mind. I never had a problem talking about sex with people. But it was very like, a, it was a script. It was like a certain way you talked about it, certain topics about it you talked about, and other ones you left yeah. and spoken. Okay. Reality TV show interruption. It's not 90 Day Fiance this time. It's Love is Blind, <laughs> season show. five. In the pause, one of the women is asking the man about sex. Mm -hmm. And her question it really describes, I think, the limitations that we put on ourselves when we don't know our bodies. The question is, does he get turned on by quiet noises or loud noises that the woman makes? Okay. What sort of prescriptive nonsense is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. So you're going to manufacture these sounds based on what he thinks he likes? But isn't that Cosmo Magazine? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I'm fooled by Cosmo Magazine. There's probably some good information in there, but make, know your body. Make whatever sounds come out <laughs> when you're connected to your body. Yeah. Yeah, without fear of them being ugly. Those are things, because then I make me think of um, ugly orgasm faces. Ugly in quotes. <laughs> ugly crying. You know, there's a few things that we all classify as like, oh, that's an ugly version of that. It's like, well, this is the face that comes with the action, so... <laughs> Just belongs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just belongs. Yeah. This um this excerpt, this practice of exploring what I've repressed, practicing reclaiming those parts, and the theme of duality. Like that changed my life. Like understanding that there's like one side and the other. Yeah. And neither of them are bad or wrong. And it's when we try to cut out one of those sides, one of those parts of us. That's when either you're raging externally, raging internally, or like super shut down and depressed. Yeah. And having no room for that duality in other people, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And when I think back into the ways that I used to think about men and relationship and, and just the other in relationship generally, I really had limited space for what felt okay to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember feeling frightened and disgusted by men's tears. Mm. And now I just feel touched and loving and compassionate, you know, and that was a, a direct response to my own relationship with yeah. tears. For sure. Like what you just said made me think about, um, you know, when we shut down a lot of rooms in our castle, when we encounter another person with more rooms that are open and well-loved and well-lived in, I feel for me it would either trigger me and be like, I don't like you, right? There's something that just fell off, I don't like you. And really, I think if I looked at it more closely, it would be like this jealousy of like, oh, you get to be that, you get to be liked. Mm -hmm. Like, how come you get to be that way and I don't get to be that way? And that would not have been a surface realization. Like I would not have noticed that by myself. Totally. It was a lot of guidance and inquiry and being open to seeing what I couldn't see and like have totally. people help me see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, or I would make myself wrong that I'm not those things, or I would be put those people on a pedestal that they were better than me. So either way, it sucks. Yeah. yeah there's no way there. <laughs> right? So unless I see a person who has the exact same rooms in the castle as me open and shut. Yeah. I would either be like, well, you have even more shut down. What's wrong with you? <laughs> or you're flourishing. What's wrong with me? Yeah. And you're, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, Totally. 
So then that's making me think of how comforting it can be when you do see people with rooms that are the same as yours, especially if you've opened up more and your your rooms and your castles more of a flowing energetic space. It can be so comforting to go like when you enter a, a hotel and you're like, oh, this is nice and clean and I get it, you know? When you go into someone else's room and it just feels wrong, you know, there's also that. And, and it's such a joy to find commonality mm-hmm. with people. Mm-hmm. And I find like we have, I, I think when we first met, there were certain rooms that were similar that were open. And then ton <laughs> that were like opposites. Yeah. And I think very early on, excuse me, we knew that we would be great teachers for each other. This is what I say a lot to actually to couples. If you can see each other as great teachers for each other, because you often hold opposite sides of a spectrum Mm -hmm. and you can either point at the other one and tell them that they're wrong and they suck and why aren't they like me? Because obviously I'm right and better. Or you can see each other as a complimentary team and someone you could learn from. And I would say, you don't need to be exactly like the other person in that realm, but what would it, how would it change your life if you give yourself permission to embody that quality that they have a lot of comfort in embodying just 1% more. And I find that when couples understand that their whole relationship changes. No doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they see each other as teachers, as inspiration, as a guiding light of, Oh, I can look to my partner and see that they're very into their feelings and very connected. Like in what way can I grow that piece a little bit more? Or I can look at my partner and see that they're very organized and logical and life gets sorted out and stuff gets done. Mm-hmm. You know, in what way can I embody that more? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of willingness is is in there, I think. There often are couples, so now, okay, now I'm thinking of 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> There's a couple on there right now where they're, they're actively trying to teach the other one things, but it's not conscious. There's no consciousness or willingness. So yeah, stepping into that role of teacher without intentionality is not what we mean. We're not. (laughs) I find that unless you've been invited to teach, that it often doesn't go that well. Indeed. (laughs) Can confirm. (laughs) So I've learned to offer insight and offer support and learn to accept someone's yes or no and not see that as personal and i also learned to this is what's hard like i think part of my wiring is i can see like things that are not working like very quickly very easily i see in relationships what's not working like in other people when i watch it yeah um i see what in their life needs a tweak and it would make all the difference Mm -hmm. And I've had to learn that not everybody is ready to hear that or wants to see that. Um, And I've had to learn that it's a gift also for them to discover it at their pace and in their own way. Yeah. So I think the door that I'm learned to open in my castle is the one that allows other people a little bit more freedom to have their own path. Because I lived in the place of many things of, I need to be helpful. If I'm not helpful, I won't be loved. Mm -hmm. And I need to speak quickly and urgently because if I don't do that, I won't get a chance to speak. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) So the combination of those two things together, um, not great. Yeah, sometimes. (laughs) Totally. Yeah, I historically was a person who would point out the answers to people. And and drag people to a finish line in a race they had not entered. <laughs> um, and this, so this is making me think of what I'm facing more into right now. Like maybe this room needs a screen door on it or something. Shears instead of a door, I'm not quite sure. What I've really realized is that I feel confused a lot in social interactions because I tend to see what people actually think and feel, Mm -hmm. which is not what they are 
expressing or intending to express or wanting to even be seen. Mm -hmm. So I often just feel confused because I'm like, well, you're saying this, but you're thinking that. So what, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, and there are some people who don't like that room. And there are some people who feel very comfortable and open in that room. And I think I've been really blessed to be in communities and around people who largely want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding it so challenging to interact with people who don't want to be seen. Yeah, for sure. I think at some point, the more clearly you see your own life and yourself, it feels good to be around people who feel that same comfort in mm -hmm. their own lives. and. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And sometimes we don't have that much choice where certain people are just in our lives mm -hmm. and we have to find our way with them, even though they're not our preference the way they see the world or do the things. Um, having children makes that interesting, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a humbling experience of learning how to let someone have their own timing and process and um, just not getting too into like directing everything and making it the way I think it should be. Yeah. 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 Jordan Peterson has this wonderful saying about um, don't do anything for children or very old people that they could do themselves. Mm. And he's like, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to be really frustrating, especially if you're in a hurry. But it's so true. You know, we need to come to this place by ourselves. We need to maintain our skills yeah. and abilities. Yeah. I was just talking with Shalina about this, you know, children and, like, not fighting them unnecessarily. Like, there's, I think Shay and I have a similar parenting philosophy of, like, keep them alive and safe. And, like, give them room to, to like uncover their own spirit yeah and I had to go that way in parenting because I didn't have a child my first child was not like easygoing simple and I was like this is a strong-willed kid like if I fight him I'm either going to break his spirit or we're going to be in constant power struggle mm -hmm. so as a mom I've been trying to take like these teachings I mean, like, how can I do my best to ensure that as many rooms in this castle get to stay open? And sometimes that means I really have to shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't take that much. Children can be so, like, humans are vulnerable, yeah. right? You say something out of frustration one time, it has a certain tone, and, like, the door of that room begins to shut. Yeah. Yeah, it happens fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and so I think for me as a mom, it's been important to, and I still need, need to work on this, want to work on this, expose my kids to people who have all different kinds of rooms open. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, that they get encouragement from other adults in their lives who encourage them to keep doors open in the in their castle. Yeah. And what an open way of being. I imagine this is unfathomable to many people listening. The idea that just there are so many different ways mm -hmm. and none of them are right or wrong or better than others. They're just ways that we're not accustomed to. Totally. Um, this makes me think of um, my oldest, who's very opinionated and very unafraid to express his opinion and has he's still working on nuance <laughs> and he's very clear and to the point much more comfortable with that than I ever was as a kid and even as an adult and like oh my gosh I can't believe you just said that <laughs> and there would have been so many opportunities in life to like shut that down to make him wrong for that and I had to remind myself like the social nuances of it I can teach him and coach him with over time so that he's not unintentionally hurting and harming other people 
and also that he's not setting himself up for relationships that are really a big struggle because he has no filter. Um, and at the same time, um, what did I want to say about this? Um, so I don't want him to shut down. But yeah, like I want him to be able to keep that that part of himself open. Mm -hmm. And I try to remind myself, you know, in, in parenting moments where it's frustrating, you just want your kid to listen to you and like be obedient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was very obedient out of fear. Um, I don't think they really wanted him to be, be obedient. I just wanted some ease in the moment, yeah. you know. Um, but I had to, I didn't have to, I chose to remind myself that these are great qualities in a person. Mm -hmm. And I want to nurture that quality. It's just that over time, I'm going to help him, you know, really learn to discern when to use different parts of himself in what setting. And I always say we have typically things that are strength and then um, the opposing muscle, the opposite muscle. And that's usually the one we haven't really put much effort into growing and practicing and probably a room that's been shut down for a long time. Mm -hmm. And how can we like go look at what that room is and like grow that muscle, open that room back up. And then I love to remember that our power in life lies in having options, mm -hmm. right? And the more options you have, if I could handle it this way or I could handle it that way, I can, I can let this part of me, this quality and trait me lead mm -hmm. or that one. And instead of just autopilot, there's only one room you can lead from. Yeah. And I think the questions that really help me are like, which quality is helpful to let lead right now? To what degree and with whom? Yes. Right? And when I was more intentional about all those things, life felt so much better, so much easier. I felt more like a sense of agency and empowerment. Yeah. I used to have on my cork board a saying from somebody, I can't remember who it was, but the saying is, does it need to be said right now? Does it need to be said, or sorry, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said right now? Does it need to be said by me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I run that through my thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm also thinking if I was in a big castle with a thousand rooms and there were rooms that were boarded up, there is a 0% chance I would go exploring those rooms by myself. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would bring a friend. You know? <laughs> and especially yeah. if it was a room like, I mean, there's a tree down in our power line right now. I call BC Hydro. You know, I don't call GG. <laughs> <laughs> don't call me. There's going to be rooms, you know, if you need to explore the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't bring a little princess with you. Maybe you bring a dungeon master. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So being intentional about how you explore, who you explore with. And I think the visual I have, I don't even know why is like a little heart dude and he's got arms like his heart yeah. and he's got arms yeah. and he's got white legs and white yeah. shoes yeah. and he like tunnels around yeah. down the hallway and he holds your hand oh. and it's like i'm gonna go and explore these hallways and like boarded up rooms with you because i need to remind you that like we need to be kind yeah. to these parts of ourselves yeah. right it's very hard um I always say, if you want to change a pattern in your life, you have to be willing to like see what the actual pattern is, right? You have to acknowledge that it's a pattern. In order to acknowledge that it's a pattern, you need to be able to see that it exists. I always said, who wants to go look at our patterns when we're just really harsh on ourselves and judgmental and critical? And it reminds me like the importance of being compassionate. If you want to see yourself, if you want to see these rooms, you want to like unlock the door and like just peek in, we have to bring the little heart dude along. Yeah. Right? Because otherwise it's too scary, too freaky to yeah. see those parts and you just want to like keep them boarded shut. Yeah, for sure. I also like having the example of other people's rooms. Mm -hmm. It's like an interior design magazine for like <laughs> inner work. You know, oh, I what, like that. what could this room look like? What this room look like? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I just um, did some somatic work facilitating right for um, a men's retreat. 
And we talked about different parts of ourselves we had to lock away as children. And these are men now who are working on bringing those parts back, like reclaiming those parts of themselves. And someone had mentioned, like, there's this restless part of me. And that, that part always got in trouble. And I think it also tries to keep me, like, on high alert, watching for everything. Mm -hmm. And then we noticed where that was in his body, and he had a moment to feel it, just be with breath and be with it. And then we explored, like, is there the opposite? Like, is there also a sense of sturdiness in your body somewhere? It's like, yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. And so we learned to, like, let the rooms, for, like, both of those rooms be open at the same time. Whereas I think for a long time, it was only the restless room that was open. Yeah. Ooh, so I might want to rearrange. Okay, now I need an, an architect. Because <laughs> if one of those rooms is, you know, on the mezzanine and one is on the eighth floor at the back of the house, it would be my preference that those be adjoining rooms with mm. a door that I can open. Well, I like that. So sometimes you're in the restless room, and sometimes you can just open up and walk into a sturdy room. Yeah, and find balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Definitely part of my finding emotional balance as a very emotional person is having to hold both those sides of myself. You know, I might be afraid, but I'm also very connected to the part of me that knows everything is as it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I need to access both of those at the same time, or I'll either be suppressing mm -hmm. or freaking out. Mm -hmm. Which are not fun places to be. Yeah. Um, so another man said um, the silliness room mm -hmm. got locked down, or it was only allowed to be open on other people's terms. Silly when other people said it was okay, and silly in a way that other people were okay. Right. And so when we did some of our body connection practices, it brought up for him this experience of getting to be silly on his own terms. Mm -hmm. So that felt so awesome. Good. And that was like a moment of reclaiming that part of himself. So easy. Right? Yeah. It was so easy. Yeah. We did like a 30 second practice or like that was the first 30 seconds of it. And immediately when he's like, that felt so good. Yeah. I got to feel silly. Right. And it was okay. It was allowed. It was on my terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, someone else said, you know, the room, they didn't use this metaphor. We weren't using this metaphor during the retreat, but said, I have learned to protect myself and succeed in life by being in my mind. Every question that comes across runs through my mind. If my partner asks me how, how am I doing, what do I want, what do I need, it goes through my mind. It's like my mind, sometimes it just says, I don't know. And then I think after our somatic practices, it's like, I realize I'm asking the wrong part of myself. That's actually a body question I need to ask. Yeah. So he started opening the room to the body connection. Yeah. He's like, my body knows the answer. My mind is confused yeah. because it's trying to figure it out. And so in that instance, it's, you know, the, the room in the castle where you just use your mind and intellectualize everything and use logic. That was like a well, you know, like lived in room. Mm -hmm. But the room of let's slow down and quiet things down and give myself a moment to feel my body and like listen to the answer from my body. That room was like abandoned a long time ago. Yeah. And in a very short period of time, doing really simple body-based practices, ones that we do in our program, right? It was like, oh, that, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have answers now. Yeah. This other guy said such a cool thing. He said, I don't even know if I can remember the words exactly. He said, after our civil rights practices, he was like, I feel that all of the parts of my body are here with me. Wow. And I had only found out afterwards that this was a guy who started the retreat being a very, very heavy guy. Mm -hmm. Like, not comfortable really at all going into body, connecting with body. And he was like super blessed out. Nice. Like, yeah. <laughs> and just peaceful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's like a room that's a gym and an ashram and a yoga studio and a spa. All at the same all time. All at the same time. Yeah. That's, that's like yeah. a good place to be. Yeah. So, 
Well, fun. Yeah. So which rooms have been locked shut and which rooms do you want to poke your head back in and see if you'd be willing to maybe unlock the door or just open it a little bit? Maybe like stuff you want to rearrange the furniture in the rooms or like what do you call that? Renovate the house? Yeah. Renovate the castle? <laughs> yeah. Move rooms around? Yeah. Yeah, like, notice your energy about this. There will be willingness and there will be resistance. There will be doors that you can see easily that you want to kick down. There will be doors that you feel like you want to carefully approach and bring support with you and open slowly. I love this analogy. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so... This is really, I think, an episode that's an invitation for you to reflect on your own castle. And you might realize like that there's a lot of pain too and grief and sadness when you face how many or which rooms in your castle you've shut down and locked down and thrown the key away for. And so I think it's important to make space for grief also. Yeah. And I think when we make space for grief, it opens up space for excitement mm -hmm. for which rooms you want to live in more and allow other people to see when they come over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grief's an important part of balance, for sure. Yeah. But you got a somatic practice you mentioned. That I do. I do. This is a practice that um, is simple but quite symbolic. Let's take a moment to think of like something like a duality within you, right? So some people, like I use the example, like restless and sturdy. Part of me feels restless sometimes. Part of me feels sturdy sometimes. Part of me feels sad sometimes. Part of me feels angry sometimes or sad and happy, whatever. You know, things that are just different. They don't have to be extreme opposites, but just different parts of yourself, different rooms, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll feel your butt on the seat. And I like to just hold out the palm of the left hand and let that represent one of those rooms, one of those parts of yourself, right? So I might say, this is my silly side. And I might even imagine a moment when I've been silly. And the other hand, we will, you know, hold out the right hand. And this is my serious side. And part of me is silly, part of me is serious. And I'll look at that hand, looking at the right hand, this is my serious side. I might bring back a memory of being that way. And just looking at the hand and being there for a full breath. And then bringing the hands so they touch. So left and right hand touching. And just feeling the connection in your hands is representing the bringing together of different parts of yourself, different rooms in your castle, right? That they're allowed to coexist. Mm -hmm. And then the final part, not this isn't the final, but the next part is interlacing the fingers. Mm -hmm. That for me is a real reminder of like integration of this. There's so many pieces that make the whole of who we are. And that they all belong, and all the rooms in the castle belong. And letting yourself feel how that feels, to like touch into that knowing. Mm -hmm. And then I always end like this, letting hands land on heart. Mm -hmm. As a reminder that that intellectual knowing now of like this part of me is allowed, and that part of me is allowed, and they, they belong as a whole, gets to sort of land in my body and spread through. And be as a be a body reminder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can do that with anything. Like we can do that with feelings. We can do that with parts of ourselves. We can do that with thoughts. Part of me thinks this. Part of me thinks that. Both are true. Both are part of me. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I experience frustration about that a lot. So let that also be okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I could only drag myself to the finish line. But yeah, it's... it's what if I like points. hopped the side of the fence of the race and then ran with you to the finish line? <laughs> yeah, we could stroll to the finish line. We could crawl to the finish yeah. line. We could somersault to the yeah. finish line. Well, I think <laughs> when we're trying to get to a finish line, we're sort of 
that's a bit of a repression in itself. Is the the finish line is the end of life. Effectively, there is no finish line other than that. We're just, yeah, just hold your hand and skip. Can you do that? That's nice. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Okay. No finish line. Nope. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? I don't think so. Just have fun and explore. See what you notice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I hope you enjoyed our unique time here together instead of in our separate spaces. I did think of something actually. Oh yeah. Good. How about the prompt? I'm learning to give myself permission to, mm -hmm. right? I'm learning to give myself permission to, to be a certain way, to feel a certain feeling, to do something that you've always told yourself you're not allowed to do in the context of, you know, which rooms are you ready to open up? I'm willing to give myself permission to peek into this room. I'm yeah. willing to give myself permission to open up that door from the castle. I think this is really important in the context, especially of repression, which is an unconscious tamping down of these feelings. There will be these rooms that you feel like you can immediately kick the door down and you're happy to enter. But there's going to be rooms that feel frightening for you. And that is a process of reprogramming your, your rewiring your system, you're reprogramming your mind. So that what you just said, that little tool of like, I'm learning to be with. You can't reprogram your subconscious with information that you don't believe, you know? So if you feel like something is too difficult or too scary, you can't force yourself to get there. And adding that simple phrase mm -hmm. of I'm learning to be with this scary feeling allows you to begin that rewiring. That's the compassionate piece that's yeah. really important. Yeah, we use things like uh, part of me is open to the idea of one day, Yeah. right? So... It's important to really work on rephrasing these things until they feel true in the body. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please like, follow, and subscribe. And if anything we've said here today has been helpful for you, please share it with somebody that you care about. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.